presenter is Dr. David Wiley. Uh, Dr. Wiley is co-founder of Lumen Learning, an organization dedicated to supporting and, and improving the adoption of open educational resources uh, by middle schools, high schools, community and state colleges, and universities. Since 2008, he has been Associate Professor of Instructional, Techno Instructional Psychology and Technology at uh, Brigham Young University, although he is currently on leave. I hear that's fun. Uh, currently on leave with the support of, the shuttle, of a Shuttleworth Fellowship and is simultaneously serving as Education Fellow uh, at Creative Commons. Uh, as an academic, Professor Wiley has received numerous recognitions for his work, including an NSF career grant and appointments as, as a Puri Social Entrepreneurship Research Fellow in the BYU Marriott School of, Ed, of Business, as Senior Fellow for Strategy with the, with the Sailor Foundation, and as a non-resident fellow in the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford Law School. As a social entrepreneur, Dr. Wiley has founded or co-founded numerous efforts, uh, including Lumen Learning, Degreed, and the Open High School of Utah. In 2009, Fast Company named Dr. Wiley one of the 100 most creative people in business. Perhaps not as obvious from that brief bio is that David Wiley has a passion for music and musical theater, uh, engaging at various points in composition, musical direction, a cappella, and a number of acting roles that maybe you all can bring out in the Q&A. <laughs> Please welcome uh, Dr. David Wiley, who's going to talk about staying relevant in the future of education. <laughs> I am not going to sing. Let's just be clear about that. Um, so if you're tweeting, I saw some of you were tweeting and you weren't sure what the hashtag was. This is a hashtag. This is me on Twitter. Um, I want to talk. What? You don't like my, you got to lead with a Galadriel quote. Okay, thank you. A loving laugh. So, um, Galadriel famously said, the world has changed, but of course it's actually worse or better depending on how you look at it. The world is, it doesn't just change and then wait 10 years and change again, right? It's, it's constantly changing. We're constantly trying to figure out how to deal with these changes. I want to talk about seven specific types of changes really quickly. Um, because I'm supposed to do this in like 10 or 15 minutes. So first is the change of things that used to be analog becoming digital. And maybe I don't need to say too much about that except like from vinyl to MP3. Good thing or bad thing, you, you be the judge. But moves from analog to being digital. Uh, changes from being tethered, being stuck in one spot to being mobile. So it used to be if I wanted to have a mic, I'd have to stand over there and be plugged into the wall and actually be at the computer to advance my slides. But now my job, my internet access, my phone, everything is is unplugged now. Uh, changes from us as a society being people who kind of conceal to being people who share. So when I took photos in the past, I put them in a shoebox and I stuck the shoebox in my closet. Now when I take a photo, I put it online and I share it with, every, with everyone for the whole world to see. Um, I, I've thought a number of times, there's a whole semester class hiding in this slide, just exploring the permutations between connections between people with other people, people with content, content with content, with what, which is what the web's about, right? Linking from one piece of content to another piece of content. Systems to systems, which is what Ken was talking about. Systems to content, people to systems. We're, we're changing very much from being isolated to being connected. Uh, from being generic to being personal. It's kind of great that nobody's phone has gone off yet during the uh, conversation study, but if your phone did go off, it probably wouldn't be the stock ringtone that came with your phone. You've probably personalized it in some way. And, Personalize the wallpaper on your desktop and shows exactly which color car you wanted when you went to buy your car. Um, as a group, I think we've changed from people who just consume to people who create. So we don't just read newspapers anymore and you know, go to the movie theater. We also blog. We also shoot video, maybe sometimes on purpose and sometimes sort of incidentally or accidental video shooting that we share uh, on YouTube. And then, of course, the change from things being closed to things being open, whether we're talking about uh, the output of our research, the types of data maybe that you know, we analyze to do our research and the content that we create that kind of gets thrown off as exhaust of our process of engaging in education. So you know, if the left-hand column is sort of the way things used to be and the right-hand column is sort of the way that things are now, one thing that I constantly find really depressing is you can just change the headings on these two columns and say, how does school work and how does the rest of my life work? And it actually reads pretty well. Sort of depressing. So I, I think you're familiar with the digital divide. If people have access to devices that get them online and get them uh, in contact with digital content, 
I think of this as kind of the, the daily divide, the divide between our daily lives and what we're kind of submitted to in school. And if you go to Google and you, you know, say define academic, you'll see that the very second definition of academic is not of practical relevance <laughs> or of only theoretical interest. So when a normal human being uses the word academic, it normally modifies the noun exercise. Right? That's the way normal people think of the academy. And it's because of this daily divide issue that school is increasingly unrelevant to what's happening in the rest of their life. Now, you say, well, but wait a minute, what, what about online learning? To which I say, 20 years ago, this is a highly innovative response. And we, cannot, we can't just stop now and say, well, online learning is our response to what's happening in the world. Um, in 93, it was our response. It was cool. If you think about these things I, I outlined a moment ago, does this have a pointer? Oh, there we go. Technology. I can try to get Audrey to chase it, maybe. Um, <laughs> So if you think about online, I mean, what's different between online and face-to-face, -face, right? Yes, all the content now is digital instead of being print, except, some, except sometimes for our online classes, we still assign printed textbooks for students to read. Um, famously, I can sit at home and do it in my pajamas instead of having to come to class. Um, but when you think about, I mean, oh my gosh, online learning is so much more isolating than going into the classroom. Everybody's getting exactly the same thing. Uh, we're all consumers. You're telling me that I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not creating new material for other students to learn from. You're telling me I'm not allowed to talk to anyone else because that's not collaboration, that's academic dishonesty. So I need to conceal my work from other people. And of course, if I don't you know, pay my registration fee and run the gauntlet of your admissions process and whatever else happens, I don't get in. So online learning doesn't even get us halfway to responding to what is happening in the world. And if instead of online learning, if we said MOOCs, oh, well, MOOCs must be our big response, right? Well, you know, no, 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 no. You think MOOCs are open, but I'm actually going to define the word open in just a minute and, and demonstrate that MOOCs actually aren't open in any meaningful way. Maybe we'd say they're more about sharing than about concealing until you go and read the terms of use on one of these websites. So I'm not going to violate the first law of PowerPoint. I'm just going to wait and let you read it for yourself. This is just, these terms are not written by an entity that's interested in sharing anything with anybody. Right. Oh, but the Georgia Tech MOOC. The Georgia Tech MOOC is going to change everything. Well, no. Do you know what you call it when you take a MOOC and you charge money for it and you award credit at the end? You call that an online class. <laughs> that is not a MOOC. Okay? So be really clear. It's like, well, we tried that MOOC thing. It wasn't working really well. Well, what if we charge money for it? Now, we could award credit for it, too. Oh, my gosh. It's 1993. We've solved it. Right. Holy Hannah. Okay. So of this list of things uh, on the right-hand column, I think openness is fundamental. And I want to talk about why it's fundamental for just a minute. Uh, probably the way, one of the ways that you hear open used most often in the higher ed context is as a modifier for educational resources. We know what educational resources are. They're textbooks and syllabi and lesson plans and videos and other things like that. So that's what educational resources are. But what does open mean in this context? Open means two things very specifically. It means I have free and unfettered access to the textbook or the video or whatever it is. I don't, not only do I not have to pay, I don't have to give you my email address, I don't have to jump through some hoop to register. Free and unfettered access. And in legal terms, in terms of copyright, I get what we call the 4R permissions. I get copyright permissions to reuse the material, to make copies of it and reuse it verbatim, to take it and change it, adapt it, modify it however I need to so it supports my students and their learning, to take two or more things and do a mashup or remix them to create something new, and then always to redistribute whatever the new thing I've created is. This when I have free and unfettered access and I have these legal permissions, then we say that what we're talking about is open. And you can see that in the case of the MOOCs, you don't have these permissions and you don't even have unfettered access. You might have free access. Um, so the MOOCs are just not getting it done for us. 
So I want to focus on these things down here in the box and talk about why open is fundamental to them really quickly. So starting with connecting. It's hard to connect to something that you don't have access to. So if I'm teaching Calc 2 this semester and I say, hey, I want you to go back and review that stuff from Calc 1 last term, well, goodness, well, you're not enrolled in the Blackboard section of Calc 1 and you can't get in, you can't see anything, you can't, it's just all gone. We used to joke that if Facebook worked like Blackboard, every 15 weeks they'd delete all your friends, delete all your photos, unsubscribe you from all your groups. It's just not a way of building community. Right? It's about blowing everything up. It's about deleting everything every 15 weeks. That's the way learning management systems work. If that content were open, I could link to it. But when it's hidden inside this password-protected space, I can't connect to it. So open is fundamental to my ability to connect. Personalizing. Now, from a technical perspective, maybe it's possible for me to, uh, to make changes and modifications and adaptations, but uh, legally, it's probably a little scary for me to do that if I know I don't have permission. Or if I think I'm going to fall back on some kind of quaky claim about fair use, or maybe this qualifies under the Teach Act or, or whatever. But if material is open, if I have those four R permissions, I know that I can always engage in this task of personalization. And as far as creating and sharing goes, there's very little incentive to make something, and there's certainly no incentive to share it, if you're always worried about, well, did the way I, you know, the way I used this, is that legal? Or uh, e when it's done, is there any place for me to go and put it? How am I going to share it? Where am I going to share it through? If there's no YouTube, if there's no YouTube, how many, ca how many phones have cameras in them? If there's no YouTube. Right? There's got to be an outlet for sharing these things. Otherwise, there's no incentive for you to engage in the creative process. When you can assume open at the bottom, this. All of these problems disappear. When you can assume open, you can connect, you can personalize, you can create, you can share, you can do all of these things. So in this sense, openness is fundamental. We have to, we have to understand this principle of openness and commit to it and engage in it if we want to unlock these other pieces. And it can't just be kind of a halfway thing. It's something we really have to commit to. Th this daily divide, um, it's not just a matter of kind of one side going one direction and the other holding still. I think the two sides are actually moving apart from each other with increasing speed. For example, when you think about content, when you think about movies, music, TV shows, those things are becoming increasingly affordable for students to get access to. When you think about textbooks, textbooks are going from affordable to expensive, right? Over 800% the last 30 years. I think this is the best way to lay out the difference. This is the math in a student's head, right? For eight bucks a month, I can subscribe to Netflix. For eight bucks a month, I can subscribe to Hulu. And for 10 bucks a month, Spotify. So for what, 25 bucks a month, I can get every TV show, every movie, and every song ever recorded. Or for 20 bucks a month, I could rent one month's access to a biology textbook. That's the math. One biology textbook here, every movie, TV show, and song ever recorded. I get one month of access. Which am I going to pick? Unless, of course, you choose an open textbook in which you get free access forever. Um, and you get permission to reuse it, remix it, revise it, redistribute it. So I, there's not time to go into it right now unless this, this is what you want to talk about in particular in the discussion section. But when you think about open and this idea of sharing, and of giving away some of your copyrights in terms of you know, what, allowing other people to make changes, allowing other people to redistribute those changes, allowing people to have free access. There's implications across the whole spectrum here, right? There's different things we can do in our teaching if we assume that students can just take the textbook, open it up, and start editing it. There are different kinds of assignments we can give. There are different kinds of assessments we can give. Uh, when we actually value openness in our research and our scholarship, there's different things we can reward and incentivize in the tenure and promotion process. Uh, there are different ways to think about our business model as institutions because even though we're not a business in the, in the sense that we worry about the bottom line, we are a business in, in the sense that if people stop paying, we don't get to come to work anymore. Right? I mean, you might be required to, even though you're not being paid during the furlough, but, but that aside, we, there are business model issues for us to worry about even though we don't think about ourselves as a business. And those are impacted by open. So in, in, in the, 
this idea of minding the future and what's our role in the future, I, of course we're going to continue to have a role in the future as long as we remain, or you might argue become once again, relevant. It's just a matter of, um, it's a matter of finding the will to make the kinds of changes that we need to make. Right? I think the Reformation is the very best metaphor for this. We're an institution, we're a long storied tradition, uh, an institution with lots of history and tradition. We're all members of the priesthood, you guys know that, right? Um, of these institutions. And there are people who are kind of making noise about maybe we could do some things in a different way. Now we can excommunicate all of those people and then 20 or 30 years later after they eat away at our membership base and our influence and everything else, we can make, we can make the changes they wanted us to make in the first place. Or instead of excommunicating them all, we could keep them inside and actually find the institutional will to make some of these changes moving forward and actually stay relevant. Now, maybe that's a slightly sacrilegious metaphor, but I think it's actually the best one. Okay, that's it. And once again, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Anybody want to get us started? Did I see you? Thank you, David. That was, that You're was, welcome. That was great. Um, I think part of the motivation for closed, aside from the fact that that's just the way it's always been and mm -hmm. we're very conservative institutionally, um, has, uh, goes back to the question of bundling. What's our value added if we give all this stuff away? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think maybe if we can answer that question, it makes it easier to be open. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a question of what you're bundling, right? I've, I've often said that any faculty member who can be replaced by YouTube videos desperately needs to be, yeah. right? Replaced by YouTube videos. What, what is it that the university does in addition to delivering content? We do things like assess learning. We do things like award credentials. We do things like uh, provide a place for social life to happen. Back to this idea of place again, right? And when you talk about bundling, I hear content delivery, learner support, assessment, credentialing, socialization. That to me is the big functional pieces of the bundle of higher ed, right? So is it true that, uh, actually I think, here you go, okay. Are there other places to go and get content? Yes. Are there other places to go get your question answered? Then come to campus and find a tutor? Yes. Are there people developing alternative models for assessment, competency-based models? Yes. Are there people doing credentials in alternative ways, whether it's around PLAR or competency-based or certifications? Yes. Are there other places students can go to find social life? Pfft. Yes, right? Now, the real kicker here is, you know, when you find out you have cancer, you don't call your general practitioner. Right? You go to somebody who specializes. Right? So the idea that we as an institution are sort of generalists and that we try to provide all these different functions to people. And there are people who are focusing on just a single vertical. I have to pay you for this afterwards. I just threw all these slides away. I threw them after the, at the end. This is the question, right? What is the value of integration? Why wouldn't I go get my content here do my PLAR through Empire State in the SUNY system and put this together, that why would I come to one place? And if we can answer that question, then we know a lot about ourselves and how we look going forward. If we can't answer that question, then it might be difficult times. We're not gonna get down to 10 schools, you know, by any stretch. But if, if, if you can't articulate what value you add to the world, it's hard to persuade other people to come you know, partake of that value that you can't identify, right? You got your one question. I know. <laughs> You're not leaving yet. I'm not leaving yet. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So, so in the open world, how, how are the content creators rewarded? Um, how are royalties dealt with protection of intellectual property and so 
how do we reward people for the research that they do? We reward them for the research that they do by forcibly taking away their copyright, who, which we give to a publisher, and then we make them volunteer as reviewers for either that journal or other journals. And then at the end, when it's all said and done, we make them pay a license fee to get access to their own work again at the end of the day. Right? Actually, as, uh, how many schools in the Virginia system total? Somebody in this room has to know. 15, okay. Let's, just, let's pretend that's true. It's pro pro probably true, okay. So, yeah, then there's VCCS, I know. Um, right, so, so as a taxpayer, you pay money into a pool, which goes to then commission a piece of research. So now you've paid to have that research done. Now the results get written up, and they get published in some Elsevier journal, which costs $10,000 a year to subscribe to. And now all 15 schools in the system go pay to subscribe to that journal. And then normal Bob taxpayer, who's not affiliated with an institution now, has paid 16 times for that research and doesn't have access to it still, right? Because he supports the public institutions. So it, it really cracks me up. Maybe that's the wrong phrase. Um, you know, that we think so differently about the content that we sort of throw off as we're getting ready to go to class and some notes that we prepare and stuff we pull together, that somehow that's super valuable. I, I don't believe in the phrase intellectual property, but you know, your phrase, so I'll use it. That that's somehow super valuable IP, but that this research that we do, we should just bend over backwards and hand it to people and pay to get it back from them. Um, I think if you're really concerned about protecting your intellectual property, education probably isn't the right sector for you to work in. Um, education is about sharing and giving and spreading and promoting and promulgating, and it is not about hiding and withholding and protecting and concealing. Faculty who are really good at protecting and concealing and withholding don't you know, win teaching awards. Um, there is a great lawsuit, great in that if you need a good laugh, you could go read more, to, read more about it, by a faculty member down in Florida a couple of years ago against students who, uh, the faculty member essentially said, my lectures are my copyrighted intellectual property, making the notes that you take during class derivative works of my copyrighted intellectual property. Consequently, I get to choose how you're able to use my notes because they're derivative works of my copyrighted intellectual property. What are you doing in education, right? Go work for Pearson or, or, or something, <laughs> right? Go work for somebody whose business is concealing and withholding unless you've paid, right? That, that's not our job, I think, particularly those of us that work at, I mean, BYU is not a public institution, but it has very much a public service sort of mission about blessing the lives of all of God's children, not blessing the lives of everybody that can afford tuition, right? That's not the... And I don't think that any analogous statement applies to, you know, to any of you. Why, why we get hung up on this idea? And if there's anybody in the room that's ever written, anybody ever written a textbook in, in the room? Anybody ever made enough money to make one mortgage payment on your house? From, I mean, it's like buying a lottery ticket. We, we, yeah, Hope Springs, we have this dream that we're all going to be rich, you know, from because I've really cracked the nut on how to teach college algebra. The thousand textbooks that came before mine, just they didn't know what they were talking about. Right. I, I don't know that I'm really answering your question except to say, man, if, if you think about ideas as a form of property and you think they need to be protected and licensed and other people should only get access to them if they have permission, I, just, I think you're in the wrong sector. I think you gotta work for a publisher. And I don't mean you, I mean, you. Not to put too fine a point on my feeling. <laughs> Sorry. The cog dog. The David. Sir. I mean, the split you did in the beginning, I mean, what other sectors do you see more on the right side than the left that would compare to? Well, no, I won't go back to it. Um, well, the tech industry, for one. Are you, are you trying to goad me into making a comment about government? Is uh, that the, no, not at all. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. What else can we compare to? I mean, we've got, you know, the, the public space where people socialize and entertain online. Uh -huh. We've got education. What are some of the other research? 
well, name another sector. I mean, I, it probably would be informative to lay out 10 sectors and try to draw, you know, draw, diagram it out and see where they lie in various places, but I don't know, so handhelds, mobile, right? Um, manufacturing, healthcare, I mean, the, the, yeah, pub <laughs> publishing, <laughs> woo, yeah, publishing as a sector, yeah. I mean, that would actually be a really informative exercise to lay them all out and, and match them up in that grid. We probably have time for one more question. Or not. Well, in that case, let, uh, please join me in thanking okay, thank David Wiley. <laughs>